Well, folks, good evening. Really warm welcome uh, here to Burkhead Free Church. Great to have you with us. This is our first in-person evening service for well, more months than I care to mention. So welcome back. Uh, if you uh, used to come to us in the evenings, great to have you with us. And, but a special welcome if you're here, maybe for the first time. Uh, maybe you came with a friend. Maybe you were on holiday. Uh, really good to have you with us. Welcome as well if you're watching online. Um, if you can see and hear us at home, I hope you can. Uh, good to have you with us too. Uh, my name's Peter. Uh, if we've not met, um, I'm the minister here. I hope you got a, a little service sheet on the way in if you're in the building. If you're at home, you can download that at burkheadfreechurch.org forward slash Sunday service. And I always used to say at this point, that's the web page to go to to book a seat for Sundays. Except, of course, very happily, you no longer need to book a seat for Sundays, as you all know. So great that you're here. And um, if you are new, there's a few things that uh, we, we'd love to do to get to know you. Um, stick around outside after the service. Uh, we're not serving drinks tonight, but we can still stick around and have a chat. Um, also, at the end of the rows, there are some little welcome packs. If you're new, even if this is just like a flying visit or you're on holiday or something, please take one of those. It'll tell you a bit more about our church. And uh, if you are here, uh, new tonight uh, in that you wouldn't normally be with us um, welcome we, we'd love it if you wouldn't mind if you left your contact details with us that's just for the government's test and protect scheme uh, you, you know the drill uh, there are QR codes around the building uh, just like uh, if you've been to a cafe or whatever you'll know the drill if you're able to scan that and fill in the brief form that would really help us and if you prefer a low tech uh, alternative there are some bits of paper at the back and uh, you could just pop that in the offering box or give it to me that would be a great help. But if you're here regularly, we have your contact details, so you don't need to do that. Uh, you'll see, uh, not on the screen, but on your sheet, you'll see there's some words uh, from the book of 1 Chronicles. Um, we, we gather together tonight to do all sorts of things, but perhaps most importantly, we come to, to worship our God. And uh, I'm going to suggest we say these words aloud together. Uh, they will call us to worship. So if you can see them on your sheet, let's say together, praise be to you, Lord. You are God from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. That's exactly what we're going to do in the words of this first song. It takes the, the words from Isaiah chapter 40. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. You are the everlasting God. If you're able, let's stand. Let's sing together. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong daily. Sweet wait 
upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. And you are the everlasting God. Let us unite our hearts and bow our heads in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving Father, we give thanks for the opportunity to join here together tonight in person after such a long time to worship the living and true God. Lord, we give thanks and praise through prayer and song and lift up our hearts to you, our Heavenly Father. Lord, through your teaching and through the grace of our Lord Jesus, we give thanks that we have been able to build our house on a solid rock on a foundation which will stand the test of time and not fall down at the first sign of trouble or strife. Lord, we take comfort that you're a triune God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all in one, a Father who will not leave us nor forsake us and ever present aid in times of trouble. Lord, your word tells us that goodness and mercy shall surely follow me all the days of my life. Lord, I thank you for your intervention in my life and for your intervention in the lives of all those joining us to service this evening, whether in person or online. Lord, we give thanks that we can call you Father and we acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit in our daily lives watching over us. Forgive us, Father, when we fail to give thanks, when we fail to acknowledge your presence in our lives and when we fail to give thanks for the blessings that you rain down upon us. Lord, we give thanks for this morning's service and for your word to us through Peter. Lord, we pray for those in attendance who are new to church and who have yet to accept you as Lord and Saviour. Whilst the illustration and parable told by Jesus in your word was clear and easy to understand, Lord, by your spirit, work in the hearts of those in attendance who have yet to accept Jesus as their Saviour. Stir their hearts, Lord, that the message would cause them to become inquisitive and keen to learn more about the Christian faith. Lord, let us not take each day for granted. And whilst we acknowledge that there is no promise of tomorrow, we give thanks that you are in control, that you have a plan for each and every one of us. Lord, help us. Help those who hear your word, your voice speaking to the hearts uh, to be in time. Lord, you're an all-knowing God, a God who knows our hearts through and through, Help us to love one another as you have loved us and to live a life which is pleasing to you. As we come to you with our prayer of intercession, we remember the people of Afghanistan, those who are fleeing for their lives at the hands of the Taliban. Lord, watch over them, we pray, that there would be some form of peace restored in that country. We also pray for the other world leaders who have turned their backs on this nation after so many years of intervention by the United Nations. Grant these leaders wisdom by your spirit. Stir their hearts, we pray, that through a concern for this nation, they would plan together to help in what way they can. Lord, we also continue to remember those displaced from their homes following natural disasters across the globe, whether through fires or by flooding. Lord, we pray that they'd be provided with shelter, somewhere, somewhere, somewhere to lay their heads at night, and through the disaster, their attention would become focused on you, the one who is in control of all things, that through the loss of their homes and personal property, they might come to know a saving faith in you, a God who provides for our every spiritual need. We also remember those from our own congregation, 
those unable to meet personally with us for whatever reason. We remember those undertaking medical procedures and those suffering with their mental health or loneliness. By your spirit, comfort them, we pray, wherever they find themselves. Lord, that their focus and trust would be placed in you. Grant them reassurance by your presence. And Lord, we continue to give thanks for your intervention in this place, for the continued growth in number as we look to become a church of 100 disciples witnessing for the good news of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord, in our daily lives, continue to grant us opportunities to share the love of Jesus. Let others see something in us that would cause them to want to know more about our faith and grant in us the strength and wisdom to do and say the right thing as your Holy Spirit leads us. Grant us courage to embrace the opportunity and not to turn away from it. Lord, we continue to ask for your presence in our lives, Lord, that your guiding light would keep us on the straight and narrow path. Lord, we acknowledge our weakness and temptations and the pleasures of life which distract us on a daily basis and pray for your forgiveness for our sins. For we ask all these things through the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And we'll finish our prayer with the Lord's Prayer, which is on your sheets. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, for deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our reading is from God's Word, the book of Mark, verses 1 to 13. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the river Jordan. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey, and this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. Amen. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Fiona and Chris, uh, two of our members there, for reading and for leading us in prayer. Uh, you'll see from your sheet that we're going to sing once again. If you're a bit new to us, you, you might not know, but one of the things we love to do is to sing uh, straight from the Bible, and especially the words of the Psalms. And uh, as we come back to look at Mark's gospel and hear what it has to say to us, this psalm's a great prayer. Teach me to follow your decrees and I'll keep them to the end. So shall we stand? Let's sing once again together. Teach me to follow your decrees, then I will keep them to the end. Give insight and I'll keep your law with all my heart to it attend. Lead me in your commandments path, for there, O oh Lord, I find delight. Incline my heart. Oh, 
your Lord from selfish gain. Preserve my mind. Oh, turn my eyes from worthless things. Give life a servant keep your pledge so that you may be feared O Lord Fantastic, please do sit We are starting a, a brand new series because of course we're brand new being back here in person uh, we are going to look at uh, at least the first eight chapters of Mark's Gospel. Not tonight, uh, don't worry, uh, but over the next ten weeks or so, we'll get at least to uh, halfway through chapter eight, maybe even more, uh, if we're enjoying ourselves by then. Uh, but let me pray, because we believe it's God's word, not ours. Let's pray that he would help us to understand it. Lord, we thank you so much for these eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life. And we pray, Lord, as we explore the life and the teaching and the sayings and the ministry and the death of Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would help us to see how wonderful he is and how much we need him. Lord, teachers of Jesus, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it has been a, a pretty crazy few years. Sometimes I, I look back fondly uh, at those things we used to call slow news days. Remember them? Nothing much happened, so the, the local news bulletin has to resort to stories about animals and local charity events. But I've got to say, that the last few years ha have brought us uh, day after day after day of big news stories, the, the kind of stuff that changes everything, like Brexit and Trump and Scottish independence, not to mention, of course, uh, a global pandemic which has turned the world upside down. I've got to tell you, though, that all of these news stories, big as they are, even a global pandemic, are actually small fry, pretty inconsequential compared to Mark's gospel. That's a big claim. But the fact is that politics come and go and even this global pandemic will, will one day, I promise, be over. I know it feels like it will never end, but just like every other pandemic before it, it had a start and it will one day have an end. Mark's gospel, on the other hand, which is one of the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life, claims that it contains news that is so big that it changes life forever. Not just for a, a year or two, not just for a season, forever. And it is news. That's the right word to describe Mark's gospel. It's news. Just look at the very first verse of it. It says, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So listen, if you've gone to sleep in your very comfortable church chair, or if you're at home and you've begun to, begun to nod off on the sofa and drool a little bit, now's the time to wake up. Because this opening sentence of Mark's gospel is completely explosive. You'll see from your sheet we have got five points today. And in fact, this opening sentence is such a big deal, the first two and a half of them are all about this first opening sentence. So we better get going. Here's point number one. The beginning of the news. That opening sentence, once again, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah the Son of God, the beginning. Now, those two uh, opening two words are, are not just a nice way to start a book, although, of course, this is the start of a book. Those two words, the beginning, are supposed to resonate with you. If you know anything about the Bible, you are supposed to think, that sounds kind of familiar. Where have I heard that before? And if you know the Bible much, I guess you'll probably know the answer. And the answer is, 
they sound not just like the start of Mark's gospel, which they are. They sound like the start of the whole Bible. They sound like the first few words of Genesis. How does that begin? All together now? In the beginning. Oh, you joined in. That's good. So here's the question. Why does Mark start this book that way? The point from those very first two words is that the stuff that Jesus has come to do that we'll meet in the Gospel of Mark is so significant, it creates a whole new beginning. The word of new life and of recreation that Jesus has come to do in your life that we'll read about in Mark is every bit as significant of the creation of, as the creation of the universe in the first place. He's saying, you've heard about the creation of the world, but in Jesus, here comes a new creation. Because of Jesus, a new age have come. A new start is here. Because of Jesus, the whole creation which has fallen into sin and death and darkness is going to find a rescue. In the beginning, Mark says, strap up, hold on tight. Here comes a brand new beginning. The beginning of what, though? Well, read it again. The beginning of the good news. And so we've reached point two. See, you thought there were five points and you'd be here all night, but we're at, we're at number two already. The goodness of the news. Uh, here's a little uh, look behind the curtain, a bit of insight here. Everything Mark is going to tell us about Jesus in this whole book could be summed up under three headings. Three words, in fact. Identity, mission, and call. So Mark's going to speak about who Jesus is. That's identity. And what Jesus has come to do. That's his mission. And thirdly, what does it mean for us to follow him? That's his call. Identity, mission, call. And you could probably open the Gospel of Mark and put your finger randomly down on just about any verse and find that that verse has something to do with at least one of those three things, identity, mission, or call. And Mark says all of that adds up to really, really good news. In fact, to be completely honest, honest with you, that, that, that English phrase, good news, doesn't really do it justice. You know, we tend to say, uh, good news... I found my false teeth. Well, I've never said that, I have to say. But, or good news, I got into the university that I wanted. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm sure if you've lost your false teeth, that, that is good news. But the gospel is an announcement of good news, big news that's on a completely different scale. It's really significant and it's really good. Why? Why? Well, because of what Mark says next. The good news is news about Jesus. Uh, now, Jesus, like uh, most names, is a name with a meaning. Uh, I'm not sure if you've, uh, some of you here have had to name children when you've had them. It's always wise to look up the meaning of a name before you decide you want to give it to your little bundle of joy. Anyway, the, the name Jesus is really just a form of the name Joshua, and that means God saves, or God is salvation. So this is big news and it's good news because God has come to save us. We're going to get back to that point in a moment. But now here's something else to notice. This is point three. The news is not new. So yes, Jesus is going to bring a whole new beginning Yes, through Jesus, we are going to see the big new thing that God is doing. But Mark's point here is that, that the arrival of Jesus, it, it hasn't come out of thin air. No, it's part of a much, much bigger story. The arrival of Jesus is part of God's big unfolding plan. The news is not new. And you can see that in a whole bunch of ways. At firstly, see, and we're still in the first sentence, by the way, see that Jesus is called Messiah. Now, that word Messiah is just the Hebrew form of the Greek word Christ. Messiah and Christ, they have the same meaning. And both of those words mean God's chosen 
king. Or we might say God's anointed king. Now, did you know there have been other messiahs in the history of Israel? Did you know that? Um, Other kings, kings like King Saul, King David, King Solomon, and so on, they would sometimes have been given the title Messiah or Christ because, well, in a much smaller way, they were also God's chosen kings, chosen at a particular time for a particular role. But in the big unfolding plan of God, all of those kings who were sometimes called Messiah or Christ, they were really just like signposts. They pointed on to the real deal. And so now, the real deal, the Messiah, the Christ, that the one God's people have been waiting for, well, he's now here. And in fact, this this whole section of Mark's gospel, the bit that we're studying, that ends in chapter 8, verse 30, it, it winds up there with Peter, who's one of Jesus' disciples, finally understanding And believing that Jesus is the Messiah or the Christ. So in a way, that's the theme of this whole first half of Mark's gospel. Who is Jesus? He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. The same is true of the next title that's given to Jesus. Did you notice? He's called Son of God. And actually, that's a title that has a kind of double meaning that you might not expect. Did you know that human kings in the Old Testament, were also sometimes called son of God. It's funny, isn't it? When when we use the word son, I suppose we mean it in a kind of biological sense. So I could say, Jamie, who's here tonight, and also Cameron and Alex, they are my sons in the biological sense. But in the Old Testament, that phrase, son of God, was sometimes used in what you might call kind of a more functional way. So to say someone is God's son, well, you might mean by that that they're they're God's man on the ground, God's man in the action, the one who's there to do God's will. And of course, that was true of kings in the Old Testament, or at least it was supposed to be true of them, true of someone like King David, for example. But here Mark again is saying something of a whole different scale is happening now. He's saying, listen up. Jesus is now God's son, God's man on the ground. He's the one here to enact God's plan. But of course, Jesus, unlike David, well, he's the son of God in every sense of that word. And again, more on that in a moment. We're still on point three. The news is not new. We've reached letter C, if you're following on your sheet now. Old Testament Quotations, And you'll be very pleased to know we've made it all the way to verse 2 of this passage now. Mark announces big new news about Jesus, but then straight away, it's really weird. Verse 2, he quotes ancient prophecy. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Uh, now, if you want the details, this quote is actually a bit of a mashup of some material from Isaiah and some from the Old Testament prophecy of Malachi. And by the way, if you're wondering why Mark just says it's from Isaiah and you're wondering if Mark doesn't know his Old Testament very well, you can be assured Mark knew the Old Testament a good deal better than any of us. It just happened to be a common thing to do. If you were going to quote from two books at once, you would just name it by the bigger book, in which case this is Isaiah. Anyway, both books, Isaiah and Malachi, they had a message about a messenger. They both said that someone would come just before Jesus arrived to get things ready and to prepare the way. Isn't that amazing? These words in these two prophecies were written hundreds of years before Jesus and they point exactly to the events that now unfold. And the messenger in question, of course, is John the Baptist. 
and we're getting to him in just a moment. But quickly, before we do, it's just worth exploring these two quotes from Isaiah and Malachi. And while we're doing that, here's a tip for you if you're reading the, the Bible on your own. And if you find, which you often will, that the New Testament quotes from the Old Testament, it's always worth looking up the Old Testament passage that they refer to, because often, like here in Mark, you just get a short snippet of it. But it's often worth looking up the whole passage to see what the New Testament author had in his mind when he was referring to that. So here we've got a little snippet from Malachi chapter 3, and that chapter speaks about preparing for the Messiah to come because the Messiah is coming in judgment. But Mark mashes that up with a little bit of Isaiah chapter 40. And when you read that whole chapter in context, that's about preparing for the Messiah to come. And the Messiah is coming to show mercy. Isn't that interesting? Keep that in mind. Mark is saying Jesus is coming in one sense to bring judgment. Ultimately, Jesus is a judge, but he's also come to bring mercy. And we'll find that those two things are woven into Jesus' life and ministry and teaching, and they meet ultimately at the cross, mercy and judgment. Lastly, the news is not new because of John the Baptist. This is, I think, letter D on your sheet. He's the one, of course, who comes to prepare the way for Jesus. And you've got to say, I think, that he sounds like a bit of an odd guy, especially when it comes to fashion sense and culinary taste. Verse 4, And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. Let's cut to the chase here. John is dressed deliberately with the fashion sense of an Old Testament prophet. The point that he's making with his gear is that he is the last in the line of Old Testament prophets. Now, in the Old Testament, prophets by and large did two things. You might call them forthtelling and foretelling. So forthtelling means just speaking and teaching and applying God's word to the people. I suppose that's what, in a sense, I'm trying to do tonight. But forthtelling, well, that was about speaking of the future, of all that was to come, of all that God would do in the days ahead. And John is the last in a long line of these prophets who are pointing ahead to Jesus, but John's the last because Jesus is now here. I wish we had more time to spend on John. He is a great, great man. He does amazing things. He's full of conviction. He speaks truth to power. Elsewhere in the Gospels, Jesus will call John the greatest man ever born of a woman, which I think is just about the highest praise you can get. So John is astonishing. But here's the thing. Here in Mark chapter 1, when John is compared to Jesus, John pales into insignificance which of course tells you something about the greatness of Jesus. After me, verse 7, comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So the news is not new, but number four now. The news is all about Jesus and his mission. Because that's the next question, isn't it? What has this Jesus, this Messiah, this Son of God, what has he come to do? It's kind of a grand arrival, but what's he here for? Well, listen, in some ways it's going to take the whole of Mark's gospel to answer that question, so I don't want to shortchange you just now. That's the journey we're, we're going to be on. But right here at the very start of the gospel is a massive clue. 
as to why Jesus had come. Did you notice all this stuff about baptism? Again and again, baptism. Verse 4, John is preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So the heart of it is this. Jesus has come to do something about our sin problem. The heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. All of us have rejected God and broken his law. That leaves us guilty and we know it if we're honest with ourselves. And isn't it interesting? The people in John's day also knew it. Look at verse 5 again. The whole Judean countryside and all of the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. I don't know how many people that is, but it's a lot. It's all of them. And all of these people, no doubt they came from different places and different backgrounds. Some of them might have thought of themselves as religious, others I guess not, but whatever. All of them had this deep sense that things were not right in their lives, that things were not as they should be. Their consciences were troubled by sin. And they see in John, I guess not all of them really understand what's going on, but they have this sense that they know that they need to be cleansed and washed and forgiven. And I just wonder if that's true of you as well, to get personal. Whether you're here in the building or, or watching online, I reckon all of us in our heart of hearts are just like these people back in John's day who were desperate for the chance to know that their sins had been washed away, that they could be cleaned, forgiven. Is that you? I wonder if you need to come to Jesus in the same way these people rushed out to John in, in repentance and in faith that Jesus is the one who can do something about your sin and guilt. Will you come to him? Anyway, back in Mark, I want you to picture this scene now, right, in your mind's eye. This whole scene. There's a vast crowd of folks here going out to John. All of them searching for forgiveness and cleansing. All of them need that forgiveness. All except one, that is. Now, I don't know how your brain works, but in my mind, this whole scene is a bit like a Where's Wally You've seen Where's Wally, haven't you? There's a massive, crowded scene of people. But there's always Wally, the one in his, what is it, stripy red jumper. He stands out as different, and you have to find him. This is a bit like that, a whole massive crowd of people all going out to John. But there's only one who stands out as different because he's sinless, and that one person is Jesus. And in this whole massive, crowded, Where's Wally kind of scene, there is only one person who does not need to be baptized because he has no sin, Jesus. But then, do you know, the strangest thing happens. By the way, don't ever think the Gospels are boring. Jesus is wonderfully unpredictable sometimes. Isn't this weird? At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. What on earth is he doing? In the whole massive crowded where's Wally scene, Jesus is the only one who does not need to be cleansed. He's the only one who's got no sin. He's the only one, therefore, who does not need to be baptized. And so why on earth, right at the start of Mark's gospel, why is Jesus here getting baptized? Well, the amazing answer is this. Jesus is there, standing in the place of sinners. I mean, literally, that's what he's doing. That's where the sinners needed to stand, to be baptized. What's he doing? He's standing in the place of sinners. We see that right at the start of the gospel. Jesus is saying, that's what I've come for. I've come to stand in the place of sinners. 
My mission is all about saving and washing and cleansing guilty people, people like us. And that thing that Jesus does right now, standing in the place of sinners, that is a theme that will run all the way through the Gospel of Mark, where we'll find Jesus hanging out with sinners, frankly, including some pretty notorious ones. And it will reach a climax towards the end of the Gospel of Mark where Jesus will go to the cross. What was he doing there? Jesus no more needs to go to the cross than needs to go to the river to get baptized. What is he doing? In both instances, he's standing in the place of sinners. He tells us that right at the start of the Gospel. That's his mission. He's come to stand in our place and to deal with our sin. He's come to rescue us. And by the way, just as an aside, that that also means going to war against sin and death and Satan. You cannot do one without the other. Coming to cleanse and forgive means war against sin, death, and Satan. And that's exactly what you see at the end of today's passage. Again, right at the start of the gospel, Jesus sets out his stall. He goes out into the wilderness to take on Satan. And that is another theme that will run right through Mark's gospel. But there's just one last moment in these first 13 verses that we just have to mention. So here's point five. The news is all about Jesus and his identity. Look at verse 10 now. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. So we've seen that Jesus is the Messiah, God's chosen anointed king. We've seen one half of what it means for Jesus to be God's son. He's God's man on the ground here to fulfill God's mission, just like, I suppose, other Old Testament kings were. But now we see that Jesus is so much more than any of the kings who came before in the long line of succession in Israel. Here's an amazing moment where we see all three persons of the Trinity. The Father speaks, the Spirit descends, and the Son receives the affirmation. Now, thousands and thousands of words have been written about these couple of verses. There are probably millions of things we could say about it, but we'll we'll just make do with one thought for now. Do you see again, very clearly, right at the start of the gospel, that all three persons of the Trinity are absolutely united in this rescue mission that Jesus has come on? The Father is not some angry, distant God who wants nothing to do with this funny plan of salvation thing. No, no, he sends the Son to fulfill the longing of his heart to rescue his people. And Jesus is not some sort of unwilling participant who's bullied into being sent to suffer and die against his will. Not at all. The Son is absolutely in on this plan as well. He comes willingly. To rescue his people. And the Holy Spirit is not some kind of weird, uninvolved afterthought. From the very first moment of his earthly ministry, the Spirit descends on Jesus, who's taken on flesh to equip him and empower him for all he's about to do. The big point is this. See that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are completely united and committed to this plan of rescue. Isn't that good? Which means your God is in every way absolutely committed to rescuing you and saving you from sin. That is the mission we're going to explore over these next 10 weeks at least and maybe more if we're enjoying ourselves. We've begun our journey through Mark. I hope it's spoken to you tonight. But for now, let's pray together, shall we?
Maybe we'll just take a moment to, to be quiet. It's easy to fill our service with lots of talking, lots of words. Maybe we can just reflect on what God has been saying to us. Oh, Heavenly Father, how we thank you that at just the right time, when we were still powerless, still lost and caught in our sin, still facing death and judgment, at just the right time, the culmination of all your plans and purposes, you sent your Son, who took on flesh for us, and faced suffering and shame for us and went to war for us and died for us and came out victorious for us. Lord, how we thank you for Jesus, how we pray that you'd help us to know him better and love him more. We pray that our journey in Mark would fill our minds with him Pray that this journey through Mark would help us to be better equipped to follow him daily in all that we do. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing um, as we end. I've lost my sheep, but I think we're going to sing Light of the World. I'm so pleased. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. That'd be a great prayer, wouldn't it, for these next few weeks as we journey through Mark, that God would open up our eyes to see amazing things uh, about Jesus. So let's stand, shall we, and sing together. Oh, 
pray that grace, mercy, and peace from God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would rest upon us, would remain with us this night, this week, and forevermore. Amen. Folks, please do have a seat. And let me say again, thanks for uh, being with us. Great you could come. And um, we're not serving drinks again, but uh, we'll head out of that door uh, at the back left. And um, please do stick around, especially outside, and we can get rid of these things and have a chat. See you soon.